was a no good, horrible, terrible, fucked heart of a day. It's a bad day. It's still a bad day. Longest bad day in a while. to talk about my port exchange um i already have a fair amount of medical ptsd because i keep running into people that are not skilled enough to take care of me um facilities that don't have the right stuff to take care of me um so I had a really horrible inpatient experience right after Christmas for hypoglycemia testing. I will get to that one. But um, right after Christmas, I had exploratory abdominal surgery at one of my health systems. And that one went pretty okay. And then I had an inpatient testing at one of my other health systems for like three days and that was horrible um, so I needed a break really badly I can't sit here hold up we're gonna have to find another chair oh man oh man Whew. um so when I had my open abdominal well laparoscopic abdominal surgery um, it was my general surgeon that did it whom I trust implicitly wrong word who I trusted implicitly um, when I was having my open abdominal surgery laparoscopic abdominal surgery um, something had been wrong with my port And my dual port, so I had like one on the right side, one on the left side. Um, I sound weird, and like my whole mouth tastes horrible because I've got thrush again. It's so annoying, and they hurt my uvula in the last one. Okay, so the right side of my port had completely stopped working. Um, I could not pull anything back, like at all. Um, I couldn't flush it, doesn't matter if it was low pressure, high pressure, nothing. So when I was in for that surgery, um, we did a full port study with interventional radiology trying to figure out what was wrong. We were kind of hoping that it was just like I had something blocking it, like a tiny blood clot somewhere that we could like put that clot buster stuff through my port and then it would be okay. And so I'm in there with one interventional radiologist and a nurse and they're doing the whole port study and they're just kind of baffled and they were like they're like you know your left side is working good your right side they're like you know we're we're having the same experience that you are and they were like you know we can't flush it and they did this whole like cool skin it was almost like embossed kind of like with my insides with my veins and stuff it was really neat to see, but I don't know what I'm doing. looking at. Like, all I can think is, ooh, cool. And so they pulled in two other interventional radiologists. Maybe another nurse. Maybe not. Maybe it was just one nurse. Um, and so they came in. They, you know, messed with stuff, just like the other ones were doing, which they were super gentle and nice. I was, they did a great job. And so then they went back into like the kind of like command center. And I'm sure they could see other stuff that I wasn't seeing on the monitor and whatnot. And I hear one of the, the head IR guy that was in there and he was like, huh. And I'm like, what the fuck? I was like, I don't 
don't need anything else special snowflake at this point like I just don't and so they all come back in the room with me like I'm still laying in the bed you know I'm still hooked up to stuff and whatnot um and so they're scrolling through pictures like to get through this one set of images and they stopped at a certain point and like oh, I know enough anatomy to know that my heart was in the picture I could see the catheter coming down from my port because this side like went up and under my um, collarbone and then it hooks in up there and then it squidges around and then it ends like in my heart which is exactly where it's supposed to be and he was like I know exactly what's wrong and he was like um, he goes but how long have you had your port and I was like six months like at that point it had been six months barely six months and he was like he just shakes his head and I'm like what like what in the world and why are you so like gobsmacked by it and he goes he he, he gets on the monitor like stands in front of it and so he's like pointing at stuff and and he goes you see how it's like you can see a very um precise line from your catheter and I said yeah and he goes now do you see this portion of it and he said it looks kind of squidgy like almost like it's smudged in the image and I was like oh yeah I do like it wouldn't have been something I would have twigged on before and he goes he goes you have developed scar tissue around your catheter at like the last three inches that's inside your heart it's all scarred over and he was like that's why you can't flush anything he's like it's not a clot we can bust up like your body's actually like it has scarred over and I was like okay and I was like you know I did so much research research before I got a port because I wanted to know everything that was possible of going wrong I wanted to know what I needed to watch out for you know what I needed to ask help for all of that this is nothing I've ever heard of I never read anything about it anything and I was like but you've seen it before and he was like oh yeah for patients that have had their port for six to seven years I've seen this kind of scarring he was like I've never seen it at six months and like so I just start shaking my head and I'm like you know of course my body is gonna fucking attack everything like the one thing that I like need okay all the time for me to be able to live my best life and it is going to completely fuck up after six months I was just I just shook my head and I'm just like so what do we do to fix it because you know I don't have any other options and thankfully my left side was still working at that point um and he was like you've got two options and he goes the first option is to remove the entire port and all the catheters um and replace it replace the whole thing and I was like okay and he goes or he goes we can make an incision in your thigh go up one of those big veins or arteries whichever one they use and he goes and I could feed a tube up inside to the bottom where all the scar tissue is and he goes and so I can pull away the scar tissue and pull it out through your leg and I was like all I could think of is that it sounded like a really bad game of operation <laughs> you know where like you can't touch anything or it's gonna buzz at you and then my next thought is if they do that which I understand like it makes sense but the risk of having any of that stuff dislodge during the procedure while he's trying to get it out that can mess up my heart that can cause a stroke anywhere in my body that's it's effectively a huge ass blood clot that you can't bust up and I'm like that just sounds horrible it just it doesn't sound safe because if my body's gonna if anybody's body is gonna mess up it's gonna be mine and so I was like you know I don't want to go that direction I said I really just think I want to change it and my left side had already been like a little weird but it was still working um, so we didn't do anything. I had my whole other horrible experience that I'll get to. And then 
I went home. So I thought about it for a few days. The whole up the leg thing just didn't mentally do it for me at all. And so I scheduled a port replacement to have the entire port taken out and a whole nother double port be put in um, for middle of February. So right now it's the middle of January. And mm, at the beginning, mm, last weekend I guess, um, or last week I guess, my, the left side of my port was acting funny. It was acting just like my other port was, or the other side of my port was. Um, super hard to flush. I could access it, no problem. But literally, like, I'm having to squeeze the plungers, like, as hard as I possibly can to get it to go through. And so I was having to de-access and re-access, like, every 24 to 48 hours. And I was, I was just like a ball of worry which I don't worry about stuff because it's a waste of energy that I don't have anyways but this one really freaked me out because if I if I let it keep going and then the left side of my port completely failed then I'm at a very dangerous point for my body because I don't have the ability to get it what it needs you know on a daily basis and um my infusions are now every single day. I've got a five-hour infusion every day now. And um, so I talked to my surgeon's office. I told him what was going on. And I was like, how fast can we get me in? And so I called him on a Monday. And um, my surgery was scheduled for a Thursday. Weeks before when we had scheduled the other one, they had contacted me. Um, my surgeon, surgeon's office just to make sure that they knew exactly what kind of port I had so that they could have the hospital order it so it would be ready for me. And so um, it was already there so we were all good. And so I went in for the port surgery. Really bad PTSD. Um, really bad. So I go in there. I get checked in at outpatient. I go back up to um, main pre-op and give them all my papers and all the good stuff and so a nurse took me in like my room my room is 24 like I'm always in 24 and so she put me in there you know you have to get undressed blah 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 and so I got undressed and she was like you know I'll be right back and we'll get y'all started and blah 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 so my surgery was supposed to be at 10 so I had to be there at 8 so we got inside the hospital like 805 parking was a mess blah 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 um so got upstairs they got me in a room and then we literally just stood in the room for like, I don't really even know how long it was because it was, I was so freaked out. But I think it was like 40 minutes or something. I mean, we stood in there, nothing happening at all. And then somebody peeks their head in and they had like their hair covered. So they were part of the surgical team. Um, and they came in and they saw that I'm like, I have nothing on me. I have no IVs. I've got nothing. And she was like, mm, I'll be back. And so they closed the door and I'm like, what in the world is the problem? Like, what is taking so long? And um, <clears throat> I finally just opened the door and left it open. Because I'm going to stare at you people until you get your, you know, ball down the road. And so finally the nurse came in that told me 40 minutes ago that we were going to get started. <laughs> And she was like, okay, you know, let me start asking questions and going over medication and whatever. And I was like, okay. And then we were talking about IVs. Well, I want to say something else. Um, I do not like being in hospital beds. They make me feel sick. And I do everything I can in my entire life to not feel sick every day. And so she was like, okay, well, get up on the bed so I can start asking you questions. And I was like, why the fuck do I need to be sitting on a bed for you to ask me questions? And I was like, I'm just fine standing here. And she looked at me totally befuddled like she couldn't understand why I didn't want to sit down. And I finally just sat on the bed just to be like, fuck, just get on with it, you know? And so she starts asking me questions. Oh, and I had told her, I don't remember it was if she was first, first in the room or that point. I really think it was that point. And so I was like, are we going to start doing IVs? And she was like, yes. And I was like, so here's all the crap that you need to know about me so that you can do IVs and not hurt me, mostly. Um, and she was like, okay, because I mean, I had to go into the whole fact that normally I have to have a vascular team come in with sonograms to actually get a peripheral in. And so she starts asking me questions and then another nurse comes in, a guy, 
Um, and so he like, I think he introduced himself. And then he, okay, I have so much to say. Um, for somebody with as many medical issues that I have, you are bound to run into medical people that do not know what they are doing. You are going to run into people that have no idea how to, to work with a body like mine. You are going to run into people that have an ego times a bazillion and nothing you say is going to slap that ego down hard enough that they will actually listen to you and understand that you are trying to protect your own body. So the first nurse that I had, the girl, she listened to me and she absolutely knew that she could not get an IV in successfully without hurting me. Kudos to her for pulling somebody else in to do it. So, Mr. Man comes in to start doing it. Halfway introduces himself, starts getting all sorts of stuff out, and I'm like, what are you doing? You know, like, don't just walk in my room and think you're going to start touching my body just because you have fucking scrubs on. And so he was like, oh, I'm going to be the one to start your IV. And I was like, okay, because, like, nobody's telling me anything. It doesn't work for me at all. Oh, my God, I was already... I was so at such a high state of stress at this point. I didn't even know what to do with myself. And so, and she was like, oh, don't worry about it. I told him all the stuff. Oh, great. Thanks so much. Like, I'm going to trust you and you've known me for about 15 seconds. So I turned to the other guy and I start giving him the entire spiel like I had to give her. And so, um, and he was like, oh, okay. And so you could tell that, no, that they did not tell them everything about my body and what has to be done to protect it. And so he starts looking at everything. Okay, so she's still trying to ask questions. So my attention is, is split between trying to listen to her, which is literally not important at the moment, and dealing with him while he's trying to look for a vein that's going to be okay. And so... It's the same spiel. You can't touch my hands. You can't touch my wrists. They're too painful and I cannot handle them. Um, I said, I've got one good vein in the crook of my arm. And I said, but it was hit three times earlier in the week because they couldn't fucking get blood. Um, and then, so he starts looking at everything and he was like, your veins are so bad. And I was like, what? no shit, Sherlock. This is why I have a port. And so he starts going, ugh, thrush is so horrible. <clears throat> so he's got everything wrapped around like this bicep and he's trying to get I have my like squeezy waffle so I'm squeezing my waffle and he's trying to get ready to hit my good vein because I can't handle a lot of sticks right now I'm just too freaked out about the last stuff and so he's pretty he's almost ready to go like he knows where he's going to hit everything is tight we're good to go he's like He's grabbed gloves to get started, and then literally, I swear to God, half the hospital walks in my room. I had x-ray techs come in with a mobile x-ray. I had another tech show up at the exact same time to get an EKG. Um, that nurse is still trying to ask me questions. The Steve guy is still trying to get an IV. My surgeon walks in the room. I literally, I was so overwhelmed. I, I think I stopped talking completely because I was so freaked out at this point. And at this point, it's nothing bad at all. They're all doing their best. They all need to have stuff done before I can be cleared for surgery. I very much understood the whole thing. It doesn't matter. PTSD is not rational. It, it, it's, it's not something you can just be like, oh, ho-hum about. And so <clears throat> my heart rate starts going up. Um, so my adrenaline starts going up because of my POTS. And so I'm asking... At this point, I am totally order of priorities. So I am talking to my surgeon because my surgeon has to know stuff. I had a couple questions for him. Um, we were to, we were already talking about PTSD on something else. And I was like, nobody touches my body right now. And I said, you have special privileges. And so my, you know, my surgeon was so excited. It was, it was really cute. Um, and so I asked... A few more questions. I had a couple things to ask about. It wasn't really like, um, it was more like reiterating stuff to make sure that he remembered. And I'm like, you have to bury the sutures. Please lose, you know, glue so I don't have suture problems. 
And he was like, well, your surgery last, you know, a few weeks ago was okay. And I was like, after I got the two infected sutures out, you know, after a week and a half, or um, two weeks, I guess. And he was like, ugh, he was like, I thought I buried him enough. And I was like, you know, it can be a, something the height of a human hair and I'm still going to react to it. And I said, but they're okay now. And I said, just bury stuff as fast, as, you know, as good as you can. And something that he did when my pocket was originally created when I had my um, port place before is the entire pocket was flooded with lidocaine. Um, hey, hold on. <laughs> this kind. Um, I have no idea what the wording is. And I have a scope patch on at the moment. So my eyes are completely blurry and I can't see anything up close. Um, so I reminded him about flooding my pocket and he was like he's like I remember that one and he's like you know we're going to do everything we possibly can you know to make you as comfortable as possible um so he left Steve ended up stopping what he was doing for the IV took everything off and let x-ray come in um because they had to have chest x-rays and they mobile x-rays it's not like you lay down on a bed or you stand in front of a um like an x-ray screen and you're still doing it somewhat laying down and so they have these like huge x-ray boards um and they're thick too i mean they're super thick and so she has to put it behind me i'm in bed my core is totally screwed because my abdomen is just taking so much shit um and so she's putting it behind me she scraped my spine all the way down i mean i'm it was just it was a bad day and so she took the x-rays, they left, um, my surgeon actually caught EKG on the way when he was leaving, and he was like, she had an EKG three weeks ago, he was like, pull it so you guys don't have to make her go through anything else, it was very conscientious, they left, I never saw them again, so I'm assuming they took my last EKG and it was fine, it's abnormal, like for a normal person, but it's normal for me, um, so they did all that, so then my two nurses come back in, She's still trying to ask me questions. <coughs> Steve starts trying to find the IV site. And he was like, I can't find it now. And I was like, I'm cold and I'm freaked out at this point. I was like, good luck. <coughs> and I was like, <coughs> you can have the other arm. <coughs> you can have anywhere you think you can stick it at this point. <coughs> and I think at this point, it's like five minutes to ten my surgery is supposed to start at 10 o'clock. So I knew that was going to be screwed up. So he starts looking for a vein. Can't find anything. Not even my good one. And then he starts looking at my wrists. And I'm just like. <sighs> and at this point I don't even know what I want to say. Because I just want it over with. I just. I want to be done. And. Um, with the horrible inpatient stuff that I did right after Christmas. Um this hand and wrist took the brunt of it um so right at my wrist spot right there um he's trying to find a good one and he was like I think I found one that I can hit and he's like can I try it here when I <clears throat> with EDS I bruise very very well um it, if I get a big enough bruise, the layers of my skin separates and they disconnect from each other um, because my collagen is so faulty. And so when that happens, um, it's almost like somebody tears my skin apart, shoves foil in between, and then closes it back up. And then my skin layers just rub and rub and rub and rub and run. It is horribly painful um i haven't found ice help i haven't found heat help um it was it's just bad and so where he decides to go is literally the worst spot that disconnected it was still disconnected um oh that's a lie oh that's a lie he tried to hit my good vein first thought he had it missed it and he starts digging which i had already gone over with him they can't do and i'm like I said, Steve, you can't dig. And I was like, I'm going to pass out. I was like, you have to stop. And he's like, I'm so sorry. He's like, I was right there. And I was like, it's not your fault. I said, my veins do it all the time. <coughs> okay, hold on a second. 
<clears throat> I still can't get it cleared. <clears throat> so he tried for my good one. Failed. Um, so we got that one held down and then bandaged so it wasn't bleeding all over me. That was when he started going after my wrist. I totally forgot the first one. So he thinks he can hit it. I said, okay. And I was like, you have one try. I was like, that's it. I was like, I'm not letting you guys stick me and stick me and stick me. I was like, with other options here in this hospital, I was like, we're not playing that game ever again. And so my other nurse is still trying to ask me questions. I think we got through it right before he started or right after he started that. So he gets in there um, with my adrenaline already a problem. Um, the pain just sent me over the edge. And so my whole body pretty much goes limp at that point. I can barely talk. Um, and I told him, and I was like, Steve, I'm going to pass out. I was like, you got to get the bed down for me. Because they try to leave me at an angle because it's better for my abdomen. But if I try to pass out, it's like it has to be flat so I can try to save myself. And he was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I was like, stop fucking apologizing and just put my goddamn bed down. And so... They got my bed down. Um, I have breathing techniques that I do now to try to save myself from fully passing out because I don't feel safe in any medical um, arena at this point. And not even with my mom with me. I'm just, it terrifies me. And so he's, he ended up getting it in my wrist, um, which felt like a two by four for the entire time that it was in there. They did my blood draws from there, and before when he had actually first tried to leave, well, he left the room to try to let the x-ray people in, and I was like, Steve, I said, will you make sure and check my sugar, and I said, it feels a lot lower than what my thing is reading, <coughs> and he was like, oh, absolutely, he's like, when I take labs, he's like, I'll, I'll do it myself, I said, okay, so, um, I... At that point, I would blacked out. I can't see anything. Um, I can't hear a whole lot. It's like this white noise in my head when it happens. So I'm doing deep breathing. Um, Steve's trying to get it finished for me. Um, they're talking to me, trying to keep me conscious because I hate fucking passing out. Um, and so, I had, I, one of my allergies that's listed on my allergy list is Tegaderm because I react to it. Um... Not all the time, but when I react to it, it is something special. And, like, everything that's touched by it just turns into this god-awful red hives and it's so miserable. And so I had already told them, and I was like, you guys can't use Tegaderm. You're going to have to find, you know, Centurion or um, Opsite, like IV-3000. I said any of that stuff. Um, long story short, they could not find anything but Tegaderm in the entire hospital or the one closet that they looked at, whatever it was. They couldn't find anything. So once he got my blood drawn and they he got everything finished with my IV, he was putting um, paper tape on it. Um, it doesn't stick as well, but obviously I'm not going to have the adhes adhesive problems that I normally have with the other stuff. And so um, uh, I don't know how long it took me to like come around that I was actually really functional again. And <clears throat> it took me a while. Um, and then slowly but surely I kind of came back to and, um, they were finally able to put my bed up a little bit and I have no idea what time it is at this point. I'm already past my surgical time. Um, and everybody just left the room and just left us in there since my sidekick was with me. And then we waited around, we waited around, we waited around and... I had seen, uh, right after all of that happened, when I'm actually like still down trying not to completely freak out, my other nurse, female nurse, had said, you know, I'm going to get all of your consent stuff, and then, you know, we'll get this show on the road. So my, my nurse for anesthesia came in, and, okay, my adrenaline is super high, my blood pressure had already crashed. Um, I was beyond PTSD at this point. Um, 
I am scared of pretty much all medical personnel at this point. I have had way too many bad experiences to get any of them blind trust or faith. Um, they've got to fucking earn it at this point. Like, you just don't get it by just because you have a pair of scrubs on it. It's just, it's a no at this point. And so she comes in and we start talking about stuff. I, I, I lost it. I just start bawling. And she was like, oh my gosh, you know, what's wrong, you know? And I had to go over all the same crap again, which just frustrated me even more. And I was like, I have a really fair amount of PTSD at this point of all of this. Um, and I was like, I do not feel safe in the hospital. I do not feel safe in this room. I do not feel safe with any of you people. And I was like, you're all, you mean well. And I know that and none of them mean to mess up. None of them mean to hurt me. Um, still happens. Um, and so she was like, we are going to make sure that you are completely comfortable before you go under. Like I had to go over all, all the same stuff that I always have to go over. And she starts listing all the meds that I'm going to have because we kind of have like a routine sort of, um, we have a, we have a pretty good routine right before I go into the OR, what happens in the OR, what happens when the surgery is done, and then all shit breaks loose when I'm in recovery every single time. There's, I, I don't even know what to do to fix any of that at this point because I swear to God I've tried everything. Um, and so they give me something to completely relax me in the room before I leave. Um, once I am in um, the actual room, like the OR room, there's extra stuff that they have to do with my throat because I have such bad reflux. So they do this like massagey thing, um, like while they're putting me out. Um, okay, so the nurse was like, we are gonna do everything to make sure that you are comfortable and then you are not scared and that you feel safe before we do anything. So she left, another nurse walks in while I'm bawling. Actually, she's like my nurse. She's the one that I have for almost every single procedure at that hospital. She's so, so nice. And so, like my mom's there trying to pet me, the anesthesiologist nurse is trying to pet me, Debbie is standing there trying to pet me and all I can think is stop fucking touching me. Um, it is real bad right now. And so the anesthesia nurse leaves um, Debbie, which is my other nurse, walks up beside me and she was like, okay, she's like, are you okay signing consent? And I was like, yeah, it's fine. And so we went through all that and she was like, you know, what's going on? Because I mean, she saw me like three weeks ago and I was like, you know, half of my port has failed. So I'm having the whole thing changed out. And, um, and she was like, oh my gosh, you poor thing. She was like, you have just been through it. And I was like, yep, sure have. Like, I don't, I don't want to talk about it anymore. I don't want to talk about any of it. Um, so she gets the consent and she leaves and then I have the head of anesthesiology come in. Um, he had an ego, um, which sometimes is good and sometimes is bad. Hard to tell, you know, first off, but he had an ego. Um, he's like, I've already talked to Heather, which was my nurse. And he was like, so he, so he kind of reiterated like what we'd already talked about. And, um, he was like, you know, do you have any questions? Do you have, you know, anything I can make easier for you? And I held up my arm, like have the IV with it. And I go, you guys are going to have to warn me for every single tiny piece of anything that you put through this IV, you're going to have to warn me. Cause I said, I said, everything that goes in at this point is liquid fire for me. I don't care if it's freaking saline. And I was like, it feels like it's acid in my veins. And so I'm like, you have to warn me for everything. And I said, or I'm going to go after it and I'm going to yank it out and you guys are going to have to start over. And I was like, I've been through this enough times. I know all the things that you guys need to do. And he was like, he's like, we're going to make it even easier for you. He's like, because they normally do like pre kind of meds like in the room. Um, and then once I get to the OR, they actually put lidocaine up my, um, up my IV. Um, it still feels like acid, but it, then it's the only acid that I have to feel because it numbs everything else and they can do whatever they need to. And he was like, we're going to do one better. He's like, before we give you anything through that IV, we're going to numb it up in this room and then we'll go from there. And I was like, that would be super amazeballs. So he left. Um, oh, while I'm talking to him, um, 
and I was like, is there any way I can talk to my surgeon one more time before? And I said, I can freaking talk to him in the OR. I was like, there's just one question that I forgot to ask because I had so many people in my room. He was like, absolutely. He was like, I'll put up, he's like, I'll page him and I'll make sure he comes and talks to you before, um, before you leave this room. And I was like, that would be much appreciated. And so, um, and then at this point, I believe my nurse for anesthesia comes in and she's like, I'm so sorry. Your case is running so late. I actually got bumped to another one and I'm just like, okay, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. They all suck. That's the answer. And so she was like, so Karen, I think is going to be taking over and she's wonderful. And I've already filled her in on everything. And I'm like, okay, thanks. Like I don't have enough emotion. I don't have anything for you people anymore. I don't have, I just don't, I don't at all. And so she leaves and my mom turns to me and she was like, I just, I'm so befuddled. And I was like, I was expecting something was going to shit the bed because at that point I was already like an hour and 10 minutes past my surgery time. And I was just like, whatever. I was like, it's luck of the draw every time. So it's no different. Just because I happened to like the one that came in the first time doesn't mean anything. And so then I had the new nurse come talk to me and she had a shadow with her, some guy. And... You could tell he was definitely shadowing. They don't have, I don't, they normally don't have any ego at that point, which he did not. Um, she seemed nice and she was like, okay, well, she told me, you know, all the things and we'll make sure you're taken care of. And I was like, excellent. What'd she tell you? Because I don't believe anybody anymore. I don't believe what you tell me. I don't, I don't believe that you know everything. I don't believe that the other people gave you all the things. Um, not intentionally. They're not intentionally leaving stuff out. People are human. So are medical people. Every single medical person is a human. They don't call it practicing medicine for nothing. And so I was like, okay, tell me what she told you and I'll fill in the rest. And so she laughed and he laughed and I'm just like, can you fucking start telling me what she told you? And okay, so she starts running through things. She got most of it. She didn't get all of it. So I started over and I, I went through the whole spiel again, which I have this like list on my phone. Um, it lists like all the stuff people need to know when I have surgery, what the nurses need to know, what the IV techs need to know, what anesthesia needs to know, what my surgeon needs to know, what recovery needs to know, all of the things. So I have it with me, so I just go down the list again, and she was like, oh yeah, we didn't have it all. I was like, duh, you know, you guys never do. Um, and she was like, you know, I promise that we'll get everything right. I promise, you know, that this will go smoothly. Um, and we were talking about my throat and the stuff that they have to do. Um, and I was asking her, you know, I am going to be fully intubated. And she was like, yes. And because they do this, they, there's a block thing that you can do. It doesn't work well for me. It wrecks my throat, even though my throat is wrecked after this one. Um, okay. So she was like, she, they left, those two people left. And she was like, we're almost ready to go at that point because somebody came in at another point and they told me that the room was getting cleaned so it would be ready in another half an hour or so um and it was like another nurse I guess came in and she just seemed pissy um she was pissy when she walked in the door um so she starts it was really weird honestly that one was weird because I had the first nurse who was asking me all the questions and all the things and then I had Debbie come in to get my consent because the other nurse was the first nurse was out somewhere else I had the other nurse guy come in to do the IV and then the question girl came in again a couple times oh I forgot something um, at one point I had to call the nurse button to have her come back in for me and she was like, yeah, you have a problem. Do we need to fix something? And I held up my IV, which all they had put on was paper tape because of the whole Tegaderm shenanigans. And, um, and I go, well, I look at this and I said, I can look through two places and see all the way down to my puncture site. So it's not covered. So every germ that's in this hospital is now going into my IV site. And she was like, oh God. So she runs in, grabs more tape. And then she comes back in and she's like, where are the problems? And so I showed her and she was like, She's like, you know, thank you for calling me. Thank you for telling me, you know. And so she got everything taped back together. Um, I still don't feel confident in it. I feel like that's, the whole thing is contaminated at this point. Um, okay, so that's that one. Um, okay, so all the things happened. And then this other nurse walks in the room. 
I don't know if she introduced herself. I don't even, she, I was so weird. And she just comes in and she was asking me a few other questions and stuff that like, I swear the first chick had already asked. And then she has like my consent papers, like on their little clipboard thing, which is fine. Except she turns it around and she starts showing me my consent forms. And she was like, are these your signatures? And I'm like, yeah. It was so weird. Like it was just weird. And then, and then she started going over the same stuff that the other nurse did. You know, do you have any other metal implants in you? Um, you know, do you have any, you know, partials or bridges or anything in your mouth? Like the same stuff that they always ask. And I'm like, no, I said, you know, I, you know, they've already asked, well, we're just making sure it was just odd. And then she was like, you know, do you have any piercings, whatever? And I said, I've got four left in. And she was like, oh, well, you need to remove them. And I was like, well, no, can do. And I was like, I don't remove them for these procedures. And I said, I remove them for MRIs. That is the only thing I remove them for right now. Unless I'm with a surgery that could be a massive blood loss that they're going to have to cauterize stuff and I get a burn mark and whatever. I know my stuff and guess what? This is my body. And she got pissy. Like, well, I'm just telling you and I'm trying to keep you, you know, from having problems and, you know, you can do whatever you want, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, that's right. I can. I said, it's my body and I can do anything that I want. And I was like, do you have any other questions for me? I was, I was livid. I was ready to come out of that bed. I was like, oh my God, you fucking ass people. I was like, I'm so tired of all of you. I was like, you all suck. I don't know how you even graduated college, much less any kind of medical program because you people are just horrible. And so... I think she may have been the one that told me that the room was getting cleaned. I don't really remember. Um, and she left. I was super glad I didn't have to see her again. I was ugh, so tired of all of them at that point. And then uh, an hour and a half or so past when my surgery was supposed to start, the um, two anesthesia nurses came in again. And they were like, okay. They were like, we're ready to rock and roll. And so I'm getting my hair put in my little, you know, surgery cap I don't know what they're called they look like shower caps but they're not water tights I don't know what they are and um so I got that done and they were like okay you know and so they gave me they gave me Zofran which they always give me um they gave me Pepsid or something to help the acid reflux even though I'd already had Pepsid and Protonix that morning but it was so many hours before um so they gave me that and then they give me first said to try to calm everything down Guess what they didn't do before they started injecting stuff? So what the head anesthesiologist told me that they would absolutely lidocaine my arm before they give me anything. Didn't happen. Nobody told them. They didn't have any information on that. And they were like, well, you we normally don't do that until the operating room. Yeah, yeah, that's why I talked to the anesthesiologist and he was supposed to relay all the information. They're like, oh, we're so sorry. We're so sorry. Fuck you and you're sorry. And I was like, you guys can be as nice as can be, but that does not keep me safe. And so I'm sitting there and I'm just like, I'm shaking my head back and forth, rubbing my chest, all of my biofeedback stuff to try to get through it. So I get upset again and they were like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Fuck you. And you're sorry. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh my God. So I kissed mama goodbye and oh my God. And it's not like it's liquid fire just when it goes in and they're like, we're trying to go as slow as possible so it's not as bad. That is not a thing. And so they finally got everything in and they reeling me down to the OR. I remember getting in the OR. I remember I missed something again. Um, so my surgeon sends his, I'm assuming a resident surgical guy down. I never met him before. Um, he was very nice. He was very, um, he paid attention. He was very into what we were talking about. Like, I don't know. It was just, it was really good. He had a really good bedside manner. And he was like, um, they said that you had a question for Dr. Kukreja. He was like, I was coming down to see if I could help and then at least get him the information so we can get it, you know, taken care of before we get started. And on my double port, um, on my right hand side on the very top of it um, I could feel it through my skin and it felt like this bubble um, it had been there pretty much since the beginning um, it was it was sore like it had been sore for kind of like six months like the whole time I'd had it not horrible not like bad enough that I would like make an appointment to talk about it or anything but 
you know, and I was like, since you guys are going to be in there monkeying around, I was like, I'd really like to know what it is, you know, and obviously if that, if it affects my safety, like it's some aneurysm, or, you know, like something like a vein is messed up or artery or whatever. I don't know where that stuff goes. Um, and so he was like, you know, can I, um, I don't remember the order. Um, because he goes and he was like, well, you know, we're just fixing that one side, you know, so that would be another surgical procedure. And I look at him and I was like, what do you think we're doing today? And he told me and I was like, eh, I think you probably need to read your paperwork a little bit better. And I was like, my entire double port is being removed and an entire newly double port is being put in. And I said, so my entire pocket will be open. Yes, you will absolutely have access to what I'm asking you about. And he was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Fuck you people and your apologies read the fucking paperwork and and so he was like you know can I feel what you're he's like can you feel it like can can you tell me where to feel and I said oh absolutely and I told him where to feel and he felt it and he was like I see what you're talking about he's like I will absolutely make sure that we look at it and see what it is and whatever um so uh, so that was that um okay so I'm in the OR they're getting me set um Oh my god, my PTSD was so high, I was getting through all the medication. Um, they put oxygen on. I don't know what happened. Something happened because they put oxygen on and they were getting me hooked up to all the things, you know, all the heart monitors and all that stuff. And my nurse, anesthesiology nurse, was asking me really strange questions. Are you having problems with the oxygen? Are you having trouble breathing? Are you, I've never had them ask anything before. I know it was something about what my body was doing. I'm assuming it had something to do with my heart rate because it goes so high when I'm freaked out. Because um, it started off, it was like 120. I wouldn't be surprised if it was 150 or 160. I'm sure it probably scared the poop out of them. Um, and so I told her, I was like, no, the oxygen's okay. And... Um, I honestly don't know if I ever got lidocaine in my, through my IV. Sure didn't feel like it ever. Um, and they were like, okay, you know, here's the pre-stuff. You know, they, they did good about warning me what was going on. Not that they made it as easy as they could, nor what I was promised, but whatever at that point. Um, so, um, that's all I remember of the OR. Um, so in recovery... Um, two things can happen after I have anesthesia of how I wake up. Um, I either wake up crazy fast. I mean, like, it's like one blink to the next and I'm fully aware. Or I literally feel like I'm so fucking drugged that I cannot wake up. Um, and I have trouble opening my eyes. I have trouble concentrating I have it's a very scary place for me right now and it's even scarier when they again don't pay attention and I warned all of the pre people about what the pain problems that I have afterwards that I don't have any of my normal stuff is in place when my brain is still messed up with anesthesia and I was like you guys ha and I I ask every time, can I talk to the people that are going to be responsible for my health when I wake up in recovery? No, no, no. We'll get you all the information. <sighs> yeah, that never works ever. It's never worked. Not even once. And so, um, and my wingman, my mama, is supposed to be in that room with me before I wake up. So, while I am unable to advocate for myself, my mother is there to advocate for me. She knows what happens, she knows what's going on, and she knows what it takes to knock my ass back out if that's what it takes. Because I'm not sitting there screaming for six hours at a fucking huge ass hospital that should be better at pain control. And especially since they have all the notes for my other surgery, which have been horrible, and I have needed, and plus my body is weird, I burn off medication because of the pots and everything else, that they, they have to give me enough to take down a horse, and then it barely helps. Um... And they don't understand and it's against protocol. I get it. I get all of it. Fuck all of that. And I said, I'm patient, you know? So anyways, this was one of the times that I could not wake up. I, uh, I don't know if I've ever been so scared waking up. 
I'm normally in pain, but it's different. When you add pain on top of PTSD, on top of being horrified um, that my mom's not there, um, how this recovery room is set up, there's a bed, a nurse's station, a bed. So the nurse that's in there is over two patients. While I am trying to wake up, um, I hear the nurse asking questions to the person next to me. Um, so like I'm trying to wake up, I'm trying to check in with my body, I'm trying to figure out what is okay, what is not okay. Part of the issue with waking up for somebody like me is I have just been put under general anesthesia which means my entire body has been relaxed for however long I'm under anesthesia which I think was like an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and a half. Um, it's not a real long time for a normal person when I'm not a normal person. I don't have a normal body. Um, so when I am in that situation, my joints start dislocating and I'm out. I can't tell them that there's a problem and so I don't know what has happened. I don't know what's bad until I'm starting to wake up. So I am starting to wake up. Um, obviously this all hurts. Um, my throat hurts so bad. It felt like somebody had punched me in the throat. I've never had that happen. Um, I'm assuming it's part of what has to happen to try to keep my reflu reflux down. Um, you know, and I tell all the people and I said, whatever you think you can do, make it gentle. Whatever you think gentle is, multiply it by a couple and that's what I need you to do. Because they don't understand with someone like me, when I wake up after surgery, everything that they did in surgery, I now feel um, the pain is just waiting for me. It just sits there and waits so patiently until I wake up. And so they must have been incredibly rough with my, I really felt like somebody just punched me in the throat. It was so horrible. I was having trouble swallowing. Um, my throat on the inside hurt really bad, which I've never had happen at this hospital. Um, I'll put a picture in here. They ended up cutting my uvula and they spread thrush into the back of my throat like everything that went wrong with the surgery went wrong um so all of this hurts horrible throat um i had the worst migraine when i was waking up than i'd have in a year i i it just feels like your head's gonna explode and it's gonna explode on my eyes it's just it's so awful um, and then I'm trying to check in with the rest of my body and I just keep coming in and out. It's awful. Oh my god, I hate it so much now. Um, so then all of a sudden I realize my right hip is out and then I realize that my left shoulder is out. Um, so this whole time when I'm checking in with my body, my pain level just keeps rising and rising and rising. And so I'm doing all the things, you know, that I can. Nothing is working. I start crying and... The nurse this whole time has been talking to this other dude, or whoever it was, could have been chick, I have no idea. So she's asking them all sorts of questions, and then she's asking questions, and I don't even know if she's talking to me, if she's not talking to me. At that point, I cannot advocate for myself. I cannot tell you what the problem is. I cannot explain everything that I've already explained to, like, a dozen people before you. Um, and then, at some point, I hear her on the phone talking to my mom and you know well she's waking up she's having a fair bit of pain you know we're trying to get it under control and I'm getting more upset and more upset okay at this point I had two pain meds in the OR which is my typical I had already had a dose of another painkiller wasn't touching it wasn't touching any of it so I'm getting more upset and more upset and I keep asking for my mom, get my mom, get my mom. I think I had to ask seven times before they fucking brought my advocate in the room with me. I was so angry and I am freaked out because everything hurts. Um, I woke up in worse shape than I do for most surgeries. Um, I was not in a good place. I cannot answer their questions. I'm asking for someone to come back. And they won't do, oh my god, I was just so angry. It's literally like, it made me feel like, you know, I've been arrested for something and I'm asking for a lawyer and they refuse to get me one. Like that's, but it's your, it's your health, it's your life, it's just, oh god, it was so bad. And they, 
and she called my mom I think four times before she brought her back and so my mom walks in the room and she was like oh my god she was like I don't know how you people cannot pay attention I don't know how you can and the nurse was like you know they told us that she was gonna have pain but you know we do all the normal stuff and my mom's like right you do all the normal stuff and she does not have a normal body so like I know my mom's I don't know I just I kept getting more upset and more upset and more upset and so the nurse was like what is it gonna take to get her comfortable and my mom was like give her fentanyl and but fentanyl you can only have at my hospital at this hospital in the operating room they don't give it on the floor anywhere um, and so I have Dilaudid is what normally works for me I can't handle morphine I can't handle codeine anything with codeine in it and so fentanyl and Dilaudid are the only kinds of pain medication that I can have that actually do anything and so they gave me like another dose of Dilaudid I think and then and she was like I'll be right back I'll be right back I'm gonna go talk to your doctor so she goes from like ho hum it's no biggie to like racing out of the room I think it was because my mom crawled up her ass um was so bad and so my mom keeps trying to talk to me and she's asking me you know like what's wrong what is the problem what hurts you know because everything is so squidgy on every surgery and so I think I finally told her about my throat I know I told her about the head um and I was asking for a pillow can I have a pillow and I think the nurse was back at that point and they were like what do you need a pillow for and I was like I need it between my legs I said my hips out and so they got me a pillow to put between my legs I was so upset oh my god I was so upset So, I think when the nurse was gone, oh man, I asked my mom about my port. If everything was okay. And she like. She went silent. So I knew there was a problem. And she said, he put a single back in it instead of a double. I think my heart stopped when she said it. And I'm like, what do you mean he put a single back in? And she's like, he came out and talked to me and he said that they could only get a single in it. And I was like, why? I was like, there has to be an explanation. And she was like, he didn't give an explanation and she was like, I don't have any other information. She was like, I didn't even want to tell you. Oh my god. I live and die by my port right now. With all of my issues and skin problems and issues healing and all the things. Not to mention having a fail safe because if one side goes down, I still have the other side. And it's not like an emergency that I have to go directly to the ER and all that. And I just, I couldn't even wrap my head around it. And I was just like, how could he not give an explanation? How could he not say what's going on? What happened? Like, <sighs> so nothing like being completely devastated. While I'm still in pain and they're trying to get all of that under control, like I still can't, I couldn't even talk, I couldn't even like ask the right questions at that point. So it took seven doses of painkillers, of three different kinds of painkillers to finally get me to the point that I could start communicating again and whatnot.
Um, she got permission to give fentanyl on the floor, so I got that. So anyways, I got, the pain was finally somewhat manageable. Um, they covered up my eyes. I asked for a towel because my, I was so light sensitive at that point. Um, I got, I think they put me to the discharge floor. A lot of the times I have to stay overnight. I didn't feel safe. I don't want to be there at all. And I guess I asked my mom at some point, like, did they leave it accessed? Because it was this whole, oh God, I had to, I had to fight for them to leave me accessed because it's against hospital protocol. But me having to access that right after it's put in, it's just, it's too much pain. And I just, I need something to be easy. And so I had already asked my surgeon and the surgeon said it was fine, but but that was like on Monday or Tuesday, he said it was fine. And then when they were in the room with me, he was like, well, I don't know if we can, you know, it's against policy and whatnot. And I was like, right, which is why I asked four days ago so we could start the process as opposed to like everything trying then. So like there was the big nurse on the floor, like pre-op. And so she's trying to understand what's going on because she's trying to talk to the right people. And she had... She didn't have an ego. It was like she was skeptical or something. It wasn't... I didn't take it personally. Like, it wasn't anything like that. Because I'm sure there's all sorts of crap that, that they have to deal with. I totally understand that. And so she's talking to 14,000 people trying to get it approved. And um, all of that happened when I was half passed out after the IV. But apparently she peeked her head in and she gave my mom the thumbs up. And so I knew I could, that they were going to leave me accessed, which was awesome. And so I think when everything was crappy and I just learned that I had a single instead of a double. And I was like, did they at least leave me accessed? And she's like, she said, they said that they did. And so I like pull my hospital gown over to the side so I can see it. And I'm looking and I... I thankfully have enough experience in my brain at this point that I know what access looks like. I know what a bandaged access looks like. I know how much catheter tubing comes out of it once it's accessed. And I'm like, this is wrong. And she was like, what do you mean? And I think the other nurse was still with me at that point because I don't think I'd been moved at that point. I could have, who knows, but there was a nurse with me too. And so I was looking at stuff, and I'm like, there is no way I am accessed, and if I am, I'm not accessed correctly. And I don't know, I don't know which recovery room I was in when I, fi when I finally made them untape it so I could see what was going on because I knew something was wrong. And... So I had whatever I had underneath and then I had this like gauze sort of thing on top of it with like some tape across it. And so I made them take that portion of it off. I'm going to insert a picture as to how they left me access. How they left me accessed was barbaric. Um, I'll show you in a second what it is now. So what they did was, there's this like, you can see a corner of it, this like honeycomb stuff. It's like kind of like padding material. And they put that over my port and my incision because Oh, and they had nothing else in the hospital, so I had to deal with Tegaderm, and I'm taking Benadryl around the clock so I don't have a reaction to it because I had no other option. Little did I know that I needed to bring my own fucking supplies to the hospital to make sure that I was safe. So they put the honeycomb stuff right over my port and my incision, and then they 
tegadermed it down, you know, so it all stays in place and I'm not stuck to my incision like where the glue is and all that stuff. And then they accessed me with what looks like a fucking pirate hook through the dressing and in between one of the holes in the honeycomb. And they threw some gauze on, on top of it and taped it down. I'm going to equate this for all of you. If you are getting an IV, say in your wrist, and they wrap you with the stuff, the clear stuff, the dressing stuff, you know, that you get, which is Tegaderm, and they wrap it around you, you know, and then, then at that point, once it's all wrapped around, they shove the IV into you and walk away. That's what they did with my port. Once they took the dressing off the top of it, there is a hole through the tegaderm. Um, like where the needle goes down, there is a hole, like a quarter inch size hole where they have accessed me. There is nothing covering it. There was nothing covering the rest of the access device that they used. I literally, for at least four hours that I can time-wise of how it should have gone. <sighs> My sugar is shitting the bed. <sighs> so for four hours, I literally had a open doorway. I'm coming, I'm coming. Oh, I've got my Jovi in here. Yes, I hear you. I know. Struggle bus and a half. Oh, man. So, yes. So, for at least four hours, I had a central line that was open to everything that was walking around that hospital. Four hours. So, when I got to the discharge room, and I'm talking to them, I'm so horrified. I... I was at a loss for words, which is really rare. Um, I just keep looking. It's, okay. So, so I told the nurse who was in the discharge room with me, who I'm assuming had to have some kind of medical training at this point. Um, and I was like, this is so horrible. I don't even know what to say. And I was like, and for right now, we have to get this like in a sterile environment. Let me talk about sterile for a minute. When you have Tegaderm, any kind of sterile dressing, Centurion, IV3000, don't care what it is. Oh my gosh, this video is gonna be so long, I'm so sorry. Okay, sterile. When you put on a dressing, okay, so you have any IV site, central line, whatever you've got, once the actual puncture portion of it is completely protected, you do all of that in a sterile environment. Nothing can touch it. You can't breathe on it. Um, you can't have me handsy on all of it. You know, anything like that. And so once that is put down over whatever it's trying to protect, um, and it's, you know, on there, whatnot, the only portion that's sterile is what is touching you, what is touching your device, which is touching your skin, whatever. That part was put on in a sterile environment. So that portion of it is sterile, which is why they do it. Um, the outside of anything, that's not sterile. You are in germified air. I have no idea what plague is going around that hospital. And there's probably 14 plagues. Um, so when I'm covered by Tegaderm and they shove a hole in it, you have ruined the sterile field on the inside and the outside. I should not have to explain this to nurse. And this is exactly what I had to explain to a nurse. I had to explain this three different times to this nurse before she even understood of why I needed Tegaderm, why I needed another piece of it. I, I mean, she literally could not understand because, and I was asking before they had uncovered it, like, why, like, where is my access? Where is my catheter that comes out? And they were like, oh, well, it's probably coiled up in there. Mm -mm, sure wasn't. Um, so I finally got this nurse to fucking understand why I needed another Tegaderm. So she comes in with Tegaderm, and she comes in with some other stuff. It was like, it was either alcohol wipes, it could have been three things, alcohol wipes, gauze, just like, you know, a stack of gauze, 
and um, extra tegaderm. And so, I'm more than a little freaked out. I am, oh God, it was just awful. I wish I could forget all of that part. I really wish I didn't have it in my head. Um, and so, she's getting the tegaderm ready. I'm just staring at the horrible, trying to figure out why and trying to figure out, oh, God, it was so awful. And so, this nurse comes at me with tegaderm and non-sterile gauze stuck to it. So I backed the fuck away from her. And she was like, oh, what's the problem, what's the problem? And I said, you just put non-sterile gauze onto a tegaderm and you're about to put that to an open IV site. And she was like, oh, okay. I had no idea what the problem was, still didn't understand. So she throws that out and then she starts cleaning up and I'm like, ma'am, I still need a piece of tegaderm. And so she was like, oh, okay, okay. And so she leaves the room again. And my mom and I are just looking at each other. And I, I, I have never been so horrified at the training of staff. It was so god awful. Oh my god. And so she gets, so she leaves, okay. She leaves to go get another piece of tegaderm. And both my mom and I are like, was the tegaderm on the bed not good enough? Like, it was still sterile. It was still totally sealed in the package and the whole thing. And so she comes back in with Tegaderm, she gets ready, and then she starts coming at me again, and she's about to cover up the entire thing to where it's not even accessible. And I'm like, stop. And she was like, what? And I said, you can't cover up the access. And she was like, what? I was so done at this point. I fucking grabbed her wrists, like, so that I could, I put it, she was like a puppet at that point. I took a hold of her wrists and I put it where it needed to be. And then she took the little stuff off the outside and whatever. And she was like, I'm so sorry. I just don't understand. Yeah, fucking, I totally get it. You don't understand. Um, I could not get out of that hospital fast enough. I could not. Oh, my God. I was so horrified. I was so upset. Um, okay. So. It's horrible. It's so bad. Um. Okay, hold up. Okay. And I had to make modifications to it so that it was even usable. Okay. I don't know what to say. I really don't know what to say. I don't even know what the fuck this is. Straight up. I don't know what it is. Um, I have never seen anything like it. Um, so, what they let me leave the hospital with ended right there. So, the top tegaderm covers all of it and it ends about right there. Um... I guess the night that I got home, I just kept look. I'm horrified by the whole thing. I'm having a very hard time processing that anybody would access support like this and think that it was okay. Um, pretty sure that you could tell any high school student, student that is going through any kind of nursing training would already know how bad it is. Um, so I kept looking at it and I was... I'm so horrified that it's still in. I don't know what I'm going to do yet. Um, I'm 24 hours post-surgery right now. And um, I've used it once. I used it at work. Because um, I went into work today. Because that's what I do. Um, so the first night, I just couldn't tell what was wrong. Like, on top of the wrong. You know what I mean? Um, and I finally figured out. Because... They, I have so many problems with it. There's no bio patch inside on my skin to keep infection away. Um, this whole connector, I don't even know if you can see it. The whole thing, like when I got it, was completely filled with blood. They told me in the hospital that I was, that it was heparin locked. Um, so I shouldn't have to worry about blood clots and whatnot. Yeah, I'm worried about all of it at this point because of how bad they did. Um, so I finally figured out one of the reasons why I was freaking out so bad is because there was no swab cap on the end, which is the orange thing. Um, 
this okay so swab caps are these tiny little caps and there is a um alcohol soaked piece of like padding kind of on the inside and so when you are done using your port then you put a swab cap on it and then you it um like it screws on so you just so you don't have to worry about losing it and so I not only had the horrible that they just like left my central line hanging out in the wind for hours and hours and hours until I found it um And then having nothing protecting the end at that point, um, by the time I actually figured out what I was having such a problem with, it had probably been eight hours, I guess, at that point. And so I'm scrubbing off the end of it with alcohol wipes, trying to get it anywhere that I feel like it's any kind of clean. Um, part of the issue with how it was left is the entire access piece until it was taped down was literally free spinning um, which is so dangerous um, that can rip my skin that can rip my port that can rip everything that I have if anything got caught on it um, it's like the tiniest two percent more protected with having another piece of tegaderm on top but to get access to the very end of it, I ended up having to use sterilized scissors and cut the end of the tegaderm so that I could access it. Um, hold on, let me cover this back up because I don't want it to catch. Um, so I try putting um, a swab cap on it. I literally cannot get it to go because of how tiny the piece is like I'm trying to hold it I'm trying not to damage my new port I'm trying not to damage my incision I can't it hurts no matter how much lidocaine I still have in there so that was a no-go and so then I decided that maybe it would be easier if I put one of my like neutral connectors on it so it would give me a little more length so I wasn't feeling like I'm just like killing my port um, so I sterilized everything again, I, I alcoholed everything, um, and I got a neutral connector on. So the neutral connector is the other blue piece that goes from there into the swab cap. So if I would have been thinking about it, I would have probably put the swab cap on the neutral connector before I tried to put it on, but I was just in freak out panic mode at that point, just trying to protect myself. So I got the neutral connector on, I cleaned everything again, I did get a swab cap on it finally. Um, uh, no patient should have to teach nursing staff about IVs and central lines and that you have to do everything you can to protect the patient. Nobody should have to do that. And the fact that I had to do that, I'm just, I'm so at a loss. I'm, I'm not letting it go, I'll tell you that much. Um, I'll figure out who I have to talk to at that hospital. I don't want to sue them. I don't want to, I don't have enough energy for that. I don't want to give my energy to that. But somebody has to know how wrong this is. Um, I ran an infusion at work. I ran a banana bag at work today. Um, I've got thrush again. It always happens in the hospital because I have to be NPO for so many hours. Um, and not being able to put moisture in my mouth. I mean, my thrush comes back literally in like 30 minutes. It's probably not that long. I mean, not that short, but... Um, um, so I still don't know why I have a single port. Um, I don't know what happened. I don't know if they fucked up my double port. I don't know if the hospital didn't have it. I don't know if they dropped it on the floor and couldn't use it. I don't know if they put it in and it wasn't functional. I don't know what happened to my scar tissue. I don't know anything. I have already sent messages to my surgeon with effectively what the fuck on the email. Um, the email actually goes to his medical assistant. 
So about 15 minutes after I sent the email, she emailed me back and she was like, I'm forwarding this to Dr. Kukraja. As soon as I have answers, I will get them to you. And she's like, are you still in the hospital? And I was like, there's no way I was staying in that hospital. I was like, I did not feel safe. I didn't feel safe from the moment I walked in the door to the moment I left. And I was like, so no, I'm not in the hospital. Um, and I was like, but I need answers and I need them now. Um, I still have heard nothing. I had no phone calls back. I had no emails back. Nothing. Um, I did tell my primary everything that went on. I sent her pictures of everything because I needed her aware of what was going on. Um, she emailed me back yesterday, um, before I left work. And, and she's like, I literally have no idea how to respond to your email. She's like, I am so horrified for you. And she goes, I very much hope that my surgeon can get me information to at least explain why in the world stuff went wrong. Um, and she's like, but I completely understand why you are so angry. And she was like, you just let me know what else you need. And she's like, we'll take care of it. I love her so much. Oh my God, she's so amazing. Um, the moral of the story is, <sighs> you can be your best advocate and you can still not be safe. You can have other advocates with you and still not be safe. And all you can do is your best. And you can't blame yourself for things not going well. You can't, you can try not to get angry. You can try not to get upset about it all. I'm so disappointed. I am disappointed in the staff at the hospital. I am disappointed with my surgeon. I am disappointed with anesthesiology for promising things and not following through. Um, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed in my, in that health system. I'm just disappointed. And now I don't trust them at all with my body, at all. I don't trust them to put IVs in. I don't trust them to touch my central line. I didn't trust anybody to touch my central line anyways. Oh my gosh. So for anybody else that has gone through this, I am so sorry. Chronic illness is hard enough without being terrified that the medical people that are in charge of fixing you are going to actually kill you. Oh my god. It was a no good, horrible, terrible, fucked hard of a day. bad day in a while so I don't know what I'm gonna do yet I don't know if I'm gonna de-access it and access it again on my part on my stuff I don't know yet we'll see what happens I guess If you made it to the end of this, you're a real trooper. I have no idea how long it's going to be. It's going to be horrible. Okay, I love you guys. I'll see you later. Bye.